Hi, everyone, and welcome to GLF Live. My name is Gabrielle Lipton, Editor-in-Chief for the Global Landscapes Forum, and welcome to the third episode of our Climate Crash Courses, which is a series we're running from now until COP27 on some of the climate change fundamentals, and this is to help strengthen our foundations of knowledge in this field. So far, we've learned about how greenhouse gases work and what loss and damage is, and if these are topics with which you're unfamiliar, you can listen back to them on our YouTube channel. But here today, we're gathering for a bit of a sobering conversation, which is on where we really stand with climate change right now. We hear a lot of different numbers on temperature rise and timelines, and there seems to always be a new report coming out on emissions or land degradation with similar but different findings as the ones that came before. So to help us put all of these pieces together, we have with us here none other than Yuva Sokona. He's the vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is the preeminent body of knowledge on this topic. Yuba has been working in this space for more than 40 years as a leader for various organizations and boards. And in various capacities, he's been with the IPCC since I believe 1990. And he's joining us from Bamako, Mali today. And we're just so grateful for your time, Yuba. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on GLF Live. Thank you, so my pleasure. Wonderful. So we are going to dive straight into the questions here. And the first one draws from some of the findings of an IPCC report that came out recently. So global greenhouse gas emissions need to peak before 2025 in order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a goal, which is the, um, the target cap of, uh, of global warming. However, models based on where we stood at the end of 2020 in terms of policy tell us that this is not going to happen and will in fact reach warming of 3.2 degrees Celsius by 2100. So what do you realistically think is going to happen in the remainder of this century? Are we going to overshoot 1.5 degrees and then have to work to bring it back down? Are we going to even overshoot 3.2 degrees? Uh, what is your opinion? How do you see global warming playing out in the decades to come? Currently, it's very difficult to uh, predict anything because what has been assessed in the IPCC report is the uh, result of the modeling and then looking at various scenarios and what is likely to happen based on some of the assumptions. And we are in getting in a war where surprises happen and then some unpredictable uh, things uh, happen. We have faced uh, the COVID and then that slowed down uh, the uh, increase of the emissions for a short period during the, uh, because of lockdown of the many things, including the economy. And then we are currently facing also the uh, issue of Ukraine and the war. And uh, no one was predicting those different uh, things that happened. So it's very difficult to predict. But what the, uh, the, 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 the model we assess, the result of the model we assess in the IPCC uh, assessment report indicated clearly that unless the uh, uh we have a picking of uh the uh, emission by uh 2025 and the reduction of 40% by 2030 it's unlikely that we'll meet the uh, 1.5 and then uh for the 2 degrees uh then to look at 2050 and then to have 25% reduction and it will be unlikely that in any cases, uh, the overshoot, the model considered the overshoot. And then that means to exceed and then to come back. And there is a number of uh, uh, issues that relate to that. And then this is the uh, current situation. We have no idea because of, and then what we can observe is most of the countries are struggling, and particularly in the uh, in Europe, 
and then to find a way of uh, you know, uh, getting the gas from elsewhere than uh, in, uh, in, in in Russia. And then we thought that maybe that could increase, you know, the race for renewables. But unfortunately, that did not happen. Mm -hmm. And in the context also of Africa, and then the African start also voicing loudly that you know, uh, it has been indicated that there will be no fossil fuel uh, uh, funding. And then it, if at the same time, European came to Africa and then to find a way of importing, you know, natural gas from Africa, and then that creates some problems. So the situation is complex, it's complicated. It's very difficult to predict anything. Thank you. And I think, um... Yeah, that is one of the biggest remaining challenges in the sector is figuring out exactly where we stand and what we can feasibly do um, to reduce some of those overshoots that you mentioned. And what the end there brings me to my next question, actually, which is that current and planned fossil fuel infrastructure alone is putting us on a track for two degrees of warming. And there are many more potential fossil fuel projects that could push this even higher. And on top of that, public and private finance flows for fossil fuels are still greater than those for climate mitigation and adaptation put together. Are there any realistic protocols or policies in the works that could limit and ideally even decrease emissions from the fossil fuel sector? It's a bit. It's also a bit. Uh, a, a bit challenging is also a kind of uh, uh, dilemma we are facing. Um, when we see that because of the IPCC report also indicated that there's no lack of money, there's no lack of funding, and then what is very important is shifting funding from fossil fuel and then to uh, clean energy uh, or low uh, carbon uh, energy systems. And then this is what is really required. And at the same time, and particularly uh, if we look at, I'm familiar, I'm in West Africa actually, and then we have seen unusual uh, uh, impact of, uh, you know, extreme event and flooding with uh, massive destruction of, of goods, of things, and then of uh, uh, even life of people. Two days ago, it was in Chad in October, and then this is something that's not at all usual. And then at the same time, we see, as you indicated, the uh, fossil fuels, funding from fossil fuel increasing. And uh, the the uh, I do believe that if we get around uh, the issue of Ukraine and then so that you know uh, the key decision makers will much more pay full attention to the climate issues as you know the cop uh, 27 is around the corner and then with uh, it will be a wake-up call and then to see, how it might be possible and then to uh, put more emphasis on those different and then to change the course of uh, what we are witnessing, what we are seeing. Otherwise, it's it's a bit difficult and then to uh, have any magic related to that. And then uh, as I already indicated, if you take the African case, they can jumpstart uh, low carbon development or zero carbon development future because they need to build their energy system. At the same time, if they see that those who are who should support them in this jump starting are investing in fossil fuels, so that will not give a good signal of the direction we are taking.
Thank you for that answer. And I think that is a key topic, um, places in the world that are still building their energy infrastructure and ensuring that that is low carbon, but also <laughs> the, the powers that be at the moment also need to lead by example and implement that as best they can in their own infrastructure and in their own continued development. So something you touched upon in your last answer as well is a rise in extreme events. And you mentioned the recent floods in Chad, which has forced people to move and it has sparked conflict. And there are so many other extreme weather events and wildfires and decreasing access to food and clean water. Um, all these events seem to be rising and they're, they're challenging humanity's basic needs. So in the immediate future, say from now until 20, 2030, what are some of the main changes in some of these tangible realities, whether meeting our basic needs that you expect to see? The, 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 the problem is that uh, the world will become more and more difficult. And then uh, because of, uh, you know, in... Uh, of the, the, the climate and then they are not prepared. Most of those countries and then the poorest countries are not prepared at all to face, you know, those extreme events. And then the country also are not at all, uh, can ha not handle. And then uh, very hard gain on development front has been swept out with the climate extreme events. So we have seen, and then that will increase the trend of the population moving to uh, the cities and particularly the capital city. This is the trend we are seeing in many African countries. And none of those big cities are prepared and then to receive in a very short period of time, you know, uh, many people coming from uh, within the uh, the other part of the country. And the report and then the media does highlight some of the migration the, from, uh, you know, uh, elsewhere and particularly in Africa to uh, Europe. And then this is a peanut in comparing to what is happening in the region. And then this is really worrisome because, and then that instead of giving the opportunity to uh, decrease or to avoid emission that will increase the emissions because of by different facts related to that. And uh, as I already indicated in the African context, people are building the energy system. If we look at the household sector, 90% of some of the majority of the country, the household energy is coming from firewood and charcoal. And that means, you know, cutting trees, uh, cutting uh, uh, the sequestration of carbon, and then to uh, cook uh, fuels. And th those are also some implication on land issue, land degradation, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, sequestration of carbon. At the same time, it's a huge implication on health, particularly the women and then the, the kids. So it's very difficult. The problem will become much more complex and complicated. And uh, so how to handle that? And then that may also uh, increase the uh, violence and then the, uh, uh, the destabilization, as we have seen also in many parts of the silent country, a greater insecurity, because uh, we can, you know, in many parts of the world, when there is a, a huge gap between those who have and then those who don't have, it generates violence. And then those uh, issues, very uh, the country are not at all prepared and then to handle those things happening at the same time. You know, the future is not, the present is not bright and the future is a bit dark. Unless we take some action based on the wake up call from various scientific uh, uh, papers, report, including the one of IPCC. 
Indeed. And thank you for being honest about where we are and what we're what we can expect to come. I think the issue of migration that you just touched on, not only uh, from one region to another, but within regions and from outside of cities into cities, that's one that we're going to see at a scale that we probably haven't seen before. And we'll have to. Um, but the yeah. paradox is that uh, despite those very dark situation, there is a huge opportunity and then to change completely the course of the uh, uh, where we are heading because there is a huge opportunity. And then particularly if you look at uh, the farming system and then you can change radically and then to look at where, you know, in the context of many uh, developing country, they are in early stage of building their infrastructure that can be done differently. And then we we can, you know, uh, design and then define the uh, perspective where we are moving toward a low carbon and then more importantly, and then you can participate on that also to educate people because uh, at an individual level, we all can take action provided that we are very well informed. And then people are aware of those extreme events created by climate. But we can educate them how to deal with that. And then in individual action can help us so, and then to move toward that direction. And this has been clearly also uh, indicated in IPCC report, one of the particularly working group uh, uh, three on mitigation, and then look at the demand side where individual action can make a huge difference provided in a continuous basis. Thank you. And yes, to all of the listeners, I definitely encourage you to read that working group three report uh, from the IPCC and the part on um, consumer demand and the scale of change that that can actually drive is, uh, it highlights the responsibility that falls on all of us so thank you for drawing our attention to that. Yuba, I just have one more question. I know that we're coming up on time here. Uh, so I want to end on, you've talked a lot about actions and the need for drastic change. And could you bring that down into some tangible actions, some tangible climate policies, however extreme or harsh they might need to be? What do you want to see in real terms um, in order to bring about the change and the pivot that we need? Uh, I think that let, uh, three years, five years ago, most of them, most of us uh, thought that it's very difficult to change the behaviors. And, uh, you know, one of the key, despite a big loss and the problem we face with the COVID, one of the key lessons we learned from COVID is that we can change our behavior quicker than we thought. And then to reduce the way we consume, the way we produce. And then COVID thought us that, and then we can be much more sober in things we are uh, taking, we are consuming. And then that can help a lot. Because uh, in the, the climate, it is not only the government, the policies that in place that is important. It's important that each individual in this planet get engaged. And then some of uh, the hope I have, and then that this is particularly the youth. And then the youth are very sensitive and then they are educating also some of the uh, their parents and then to uh, be sensitive to climate issues and then the food we eat and then the uh, the uh, the clothes we wear and then our daily life and then need to be uh, in line with uh, what we uh, the science is telling us and then if that happened the, the course will change I have tried back to the early days of the uh, climate and then to be one among the advocate of Article 6 of the Convention that said education 
information awareness raising in a continuous basis, not based when there is an extreme event, and then not based when uh, there is uh, a big, you know, like fire, like uh, forest fire, like uh, flooding, like uh, severe drought, like we are witnessing actually in the Horn of Africa, but in a continuous basis. And this is how we get rid of, for instance, smoking in uh, many areas. And uh, th those are some of the very important. And so that if we have the majority of the people and the public in large getting seriously about it, and then they can make pressure on government to act, to act decisively, and then to act faster and bigger. Thank you for that amazing take home message. And I think that's something that we haven't integrated as a public before, uh, what you're talking about, a science-based lifestyle, almost a fact-based lifestyle, bringing that climate science, not just expecting policymakers to take that and feed that into their decisions, but also feeding that into our own day-to-day -day decisions. And that would be a powerful and <laughs> quite a radical societal shift, but absolutely one that needs to happen. So thank you so much for leaving us with that message. We'll wrap up here. Um, we have one more climate crash course coming next week, which will be taking some of Yuba's messages that we heard here today and feeding those into how do we reduce emissions? What does the term net zero really mean? And is it possible to achieve? I'll also take this opportunity to alert you to the event that we at the Global Landscapes Forum are hosting alongside COP27 in person and online on 11th and 12th of November. You can find that at globallandscapesforum.org. And from wherever you are joining here today, I would just like to thank you for creating some space, for making some time to hear these important messages. And once again, an amazing thank you to you, Yuba, Yuba for sharing with us and for um, leaving us with these thoughts to chew on for the rest of the day and in the days and weeks to come. So thank you once again, and thank you to everyone for joining us here on GLF Live. We'll see you next week. Thank you. And bye. Imagine the world in the year 2050. Chances are, it'll look a lot like the world we live in today, except even hotter, drier, and more unstable. We'll see even deadlier and more destructive disasters. New conflicts will arise over the few precious natural resources we have left. But wait a minute, is that really how we want our future to look? What if we could take control of our fate by building our resilience against the challenges to come. It's time to move to a low carbon economy that puts people and nature first. We need all hands on deck to rethink our relationship with our planet. And to do that, we have to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to contribute. Find out how by joining us on the 11th and 12th of November and bringing your voice to the UN COP27 conference in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt, from wherever you are in the world. Connect and network with top innovators, scientists, creatives, and financiers. Find hope through art, music, and inspiring stories. And help build the world of tomorrow on the frontiers of change. We'll see you at GLF Climate.